Do you struggle with mixing plaster? Clay slip slipping through your fingers? Is slip casting just too hard? Have I got just the thing for you, friend? I'm Ellie Katz of Katz Creates Products, and I want to introduce you to the 3D printed slab mold. That's right, your slip casting days are behind you now that the 3D printed slab mold is here to save you from the tedium and mess of plaster molds and liquid clay. Just for five easy payments of, um, uh, actually it's free. Mm, I'm just gonna teach you how to make your own. Yeah, this, uh, I'm not sure if this is working. Hold on a minute. Yeah, this is a bit better. Oh, I don't need this anymore. Yeah, that's a bit more like it. Where was I? Right. 3D printed slab molds. Historically speaking, complex and unusual shapes within ceramics have been typically achieved by slip casting, the art of creating a piece by pouring liquid clay into a plaster mold, which absorbs the water from the slip, leaving solid clay behind. There are of course other methods that use molds and forms, but most work best with simple shapes or have other limitations. I don't do well with limitations. I wanted to see what else was possible, and I had a good feeling that 3D design and 3D printing might help me with this. Thanks to the support of the Arts Council of England and the DYCP grant program, I was able to explore, develop, and test the concept for a 3D printed slab mold over the last several months. And yeah, they work pretty great as it turns out. I'm afraid I'm not actually making these molds to sell. I am, however, here to walk you through the process, from transforming your own designs into 3D printed press molds, to turning flat slabs of clay into gorgeous, usable shapes. You in? Let's get started then. Before we bust out the clay, or even before booting up the design software, we need to talk a little bit about mold making, and the key aspects of designing a mold for pressing clay slabs into. Consider this Mold Making 101. Whether you're using silicone, plaster, or 3D printed plastic, all molds follow a few of the same rules. When it comes to designing a piece to be made with a mold, one of the most important things to be aware of from the beginning is something called undercuts. Undercuts are surfaces on the final piece that prevent the mold from being pulled away cleanly. Avoiding undercuts entirely is one way to approach this problem, and one-part molds are definitely the easiest molds to make and deal with. Fortunately, multi-part molds and smart seam placement can solve the majority of undercut issues. The best approach to this when thinking of your mold design is to see the high point of your positive as kind of like your seam guide with the mold part pulling away from the seam. As with many things, it's best to start simpler and work your way up in complexity. Designing a mold for slab pressing does have a few additional considerations to keep in mind. First is how you're going to apply the slabs. Slip casting and many molding techniques simply require a small entrance to pour or inject the liquid, but slab press molds require a different approach. You need to be able to get your hands inside to, well, press the clay into the grooves. Wide mouth vessels work particularly well with this method, but you can also use multi-part molds to your advantage here to press individual sides before slipping and scoring together. The second is going to be how to make your life easier when it comes to demolding your piece. Unlike plaster, plastic doesn't absorb water from the clay to speed up the drying process. That means how much air can reach the clay will determine how quickly it'll harden, and no matter what, it will still be a bit softer than you think when you go to demold it. Something like this hex cup absolutely did work as a one-piece mold, but I was required to wait much longer for the piece to harden and pull away from the walls before it would come away cleanly. Turning it into a three-piece mold not only made it more efficient to build, but allowed me to demold it sooner and more safely. This is obviously a very rudimentary look at mold making, and I absolutely recommend looking a bit more into the theory if you've never made your own molds before. Or you can be like me and simply dive in and learn as you go.
The great thing about this method is that there's a lot of room for playing around and you can create things that would have been impossible to make out of clay by hand. So don't be afraid to dive into your CAD software of choice and start designing. I created both of my molds by starting with the positive, otherwise known as the end result thing that I want in clay. It's good to be able to visualize the object you want to make alongside making the mold design easier to create. Since making seams that followed the curves would result in less cleanup later, I lofted splines instead of doing a straight extrusion. I went with three and four pieces for the molds respectively, as that would be enough to avoid most undercuts and hopefully allow for a smooth demolding. I added keys along the sides of the mold that touched to help alignment and hold the mold together. While not fully necessary, it can be helpful to make guides or cutters for getting the right sized and shaped pieces of clay slab for your mold. For the wavy vase, I just made a cutter for the base, but for the hex cup, I designed a cutter for the side pieces as well. Don't forget to make your mold larger than you want the final piece to be. The amount will be dependent on the clay you use and how much shrinkage it has in the final firing. You can either build the mold larger or simply scale up the model when you go to print it. Just don't forget entirely or you'll end up with a piece surprisingly smaller than expected. When it comes time to print the mold pieces, larger nozzles are your friend. I find the 6mm nozzle to be a good choice to speed things up a bit while still being able to get pretty small layers, but if your mold is really big, a 0.8mm might be even better. Strength is not hugely important in this kind of print, so go as light on the infill as you feel safe doing. Print in a material you feel comfortable using, as the material itself makes little difference to the process. Smaller layers will result in easier cleanup on the final piece, whereas bigger layers will print faster. Tailor as you see fit. Once the mold is printed, then the real fun can begin. Different kinds of clay will act a bit differently in a mold like this, so be sure to use a clay that you are at least a little familiar with. I'll be using Draycott White Stoneware as well as Audrey Black and Porcelain for my pieces. Once your clay is wedged up, cut off a few pieces to roll out into slabs. This can be done with a rolling pin and guide rails or with a slab roller if you have access to one. I love the slab roller. Before you start using your mold, prepare it for the clay with a thorough coating of corn flour. This will prevent the clay from sticking too much to the plastic and help with demolding later. With both the mold and the clay ready, it's time to start cutting out your pieces and pressing them into the mold. For the hex cup, I use my cutter to create the clay pieces and press them gently into each side of the mold. I trim up the edges with a knife, then use a silicone rib to smooth things out and make sure the clay is even. Once the three sides are prepared, I will slip and score the edges before pressing the sides together, then smooth out those seams on the inside by hand while the clay is still soft enough to do so. For the wavy vase, I'll put two of the mold pieces together to create a half shell and freeform cut a piece from the slab to drape inside. I press the clay into the form just enough to make sure it's filling the space before trimming down the sides. From there, I carefully push the clay into the mold with my fingers, making sure to fill all the crevices without making the clay too thin anyway. This shape is challenging and it takes some time to check over and make sure it's done correctly. Once I'm satisfied, I cut the excess from the top and bottom and repeat on the other side. Same as with the hex cup, once both sides are ready, I slip and score the edges and press the mold pieces together. Make sure to save a bit of slab for the base pieces. You can cut them out now if you wish, or save that step for later. Either way, drape a bit of plastic over the clay so it doesn't dry out too much. If your mold needs help staying together, rubber bands or ratchet straps can be applied to hold the mold tight but your mold may not need it. Once it's all safe and secure, leave it alone for a while to set up. Have a cuppa, work on something else, take a nap, you do you. Just give it some time to harden. Check the clay at the edges after some time has passed to see how quickly it's drying. If it's drying faster than expected and it's already pulling away from the mold, then it's time to get in there and start removing it. If it's still really wet and stuck fast, you can speed things up a bit with a hair dryer or heat gun on low. Just make sure to not dry it too much. When the clay is firm without being hard or dry, you can start delicately pulling the mold apart to expose the clay. Don't be afraid to give it a blast of hot air if it's too soft in places. Molds with narrow openings will get less air in, which means that inner parts may be softer than the edges. 
Keep working at the mold pieces until it completely comes away. Don't be afraid to take a moment to admire your newborn creation. Don't get too comfortable as there's a bit more to do before you take a break. These pieces need bases and a handle, so now is the time to do that. Cut your base pieces if you haven't already and slip and score to attach them to the bottom of the molded clay. Reinforce the inner joins if you can. Once the base is on, it's cleanup time. Trim down the edges of the base and smooth out the edge where it's been attached to the main piece. Using a fine sponge, gently rub the faces of the piece until the layer lines fade away. This can be further improved with a soft silicone rib as well. Tidy up the inside if you can, and don't forget to attach any handles or extra pieces. Maker's Mark is optional, but it's always a nice touch, I think. Dry your piece in preparation for the bisque firing. It's complete! This process will of course be slightly different with a piece of your own unique design, but the steps should be about the same. Practice makes perfect with this technique, but with time you should be able to create more or less identical pieces in relatively little time. This may all seem relatively simple and straightforward, but a huge amount of trial and error has gone into the development of this process to make it as easy and efficient as possible. I've only tried two different shapes with this technique, but there's a whole world of possibilities out there. So please share your mold designs and finished pieces with me either here or on social media. I would love to see what you create and hear about any additional discoveries you may have made. There is still so much to explore around ways to improve this ancient art with technology, and I hope to continue to do so while sharing the results with all of you. A huge, huge thanks again to the Arts Council of England for supporting this research and growth of my creative practice as well as to my patrons for their ongoing support of my artistic spelunking. If you want to see what else I've made while doing this grant study, make sure to check out my website to see all of my efforts collated in one place, alongside the other wild and interesting things that I'm creating. I have a good feeling there will be more things like this to come. In the meantime, keep creating.